Alrighty, so our unit on thermodynamics is a continuation of thermochemistry that we did back in unit 4. But thermodynamics, as it says here, is we're going to study the relationship between heat and other forms of energy that are involved in a chemical or physical process. Dynamic change, chemical physical change. Alright, so first up, remember that we defined internal energy as the sum of potential and kinetic energy of particles in a substance. Now most of our chemicals are pretty much all potential energy, but there is some motion of electrons and whatnot, so there's a little bit of kinetic energy involved as well. But typically we're talking about potential. And we see here that the delta U, the change in the internal energy, just like any of our deltas, is the final minus initial. And internal energy, like enthalpy that we talked about and we'll talk about again, is a state function. It doesn't matter the path that we take to get there. We're always just interested in the difference between the final and initial values. And that's what it says here. Changes in internal energy are measured by noting exchanges of energy between the system and its surroundings, specifically heat and work. And so again, we have talked about heat in the past. Okay, heat that flows into the system will have a positive value. That's an endothermic process. Heat that flows out of the system to the surroundings will have a negative value. That's exothermic. Work is force times distance, and you'll spend a lot more time doing looking at different types of work and calculations in physics. But for us in chemistry, we're interested in pressure volume work. Specifically, when a reaction involves the production of a gas, we can figure out how much work the gas has to do against the atmosphere. And we can measure that in these little cylinders that allow a piston to move. And so that's the kind of work that we will look at. But just as a little summary, heat and work are positive. They have a positive value when heat is absorbed by the system or when work is done on the system. They have a negative value, heat, when it's released by the system, and work when it's done by the system. And that, like I said, would be the gas in a reaction working on the atmosphere. So our first law of thermodynamics. Don't talk about thermodynamics. <laughs> Just kidding. Fight Club reference? Okay. The change in internal energy of a system is going to be equal to heat plus work. In other words, the law of conservation of energy. We can't create energy, we can't destroy energy. It's there in the chemicals. And when the reaction goes, we end up getting a change in this internal energy that we can measure through work and heat. And we're going to consider this, like I said, through a chemical system that will indeed involve this pressure volume work. And here we see it. If I take zinc and react it with an acid, I'll make bubbles. Hydrogen gas, of course. And that hydrogen gas will work against the atmosphere. The delta H, the enthalpy change for this reaction, is negative 152.4 kilojoules, which was found experimentally, you remember, in a calorimeter. So my delta H equals Q, which we'll discuss a little more in depth in a moment. And the work again is negative P delta V, pressure volume work. And so if I have one mole of zinc reacting with an excess of hydrochloric acid, I will yield one mole of hydrogen. And this, of course, is at a nice pressure of one atmosphere and temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. <coughs> Sorry, a little choking there. But when I have that information, I can find the volume, the change in the volume of the gas that's produced thanks to Pivnert, the ideal gas law. I know pressure, moles, R, and temperature, so my volume in this situation is 24.5 liters. So I go ahead and plug into my equation. Work is equal to negative pressure, and I'm going to use 101 point, I'm sorry, 1.01 times 10 to the negative fifth pascals because I want my 
work unit to come out in kilojoules. Same thing here, 24.5 times 10 to the negative third meters cubed. So I have the appropriate units. And I see I get negative 2.47 kilojoules. So from the first law of thermodynamics, change in internal energy for this reaction is my delta H, my Q, plus work, and it's negative 154.9 kilojoules. So what does that mean? And that's what it says here. When one mole of zinc reacts with excess hydrochloric acid, the internal energy changes as we're going from reactants to products a total of 154.9 kilojoules. Most of that comes in the form of heat, 152.4. And then there's a little bit of that that is also expansion work, 2.47. So again, that's my first law of thermodynamics, but it's showing, again, the conservation of energy. And we were able to measure heat and work in a laboratory situation, and that helped explain, and we were able to um, reason out the change in the internal energy due to the measurable energy, I'm sorry, heat and work changes in the lab. So again, enthalpy H is defined as the internal energy plus pressure times volume. We saw that equation back in unit four. So the change in internal energy, if I rearrange this equation and include the change symbol, the change in internal energy is delta H minus P delta V. If I rearrange again, I end up seeing that delta H is equal to the change in the internal energy plus P delta V. Now, if you have the notes packet, I fixed this a little here. There was a couple little typos that I didn't like. So, of course, my change in enthalpy is the final enthalpy minus the initial enthalpy. And you can say, see that I have turned my UPV into final and initial. Then I collected like terms, U's, pulled out the P, and there's my V's. So U final minus U initial is delta U, and then P delta V. Delta U we just defined for the first law of thermodynamics as Q plus W. And W we've defined as Q minus P delta V. I'm sorry. W is just the <laughs> negative P delta V part. So now I can plug that in Q minus P delta V plus P delta V. Basically, all I wanted you to see here is that Indeed, the change in enthalpy is equal to heat, Q. I think some of you like to see where some of those statements come from, so that's just why I put that there. And don't forget this lovely equation, although we'll be using it much, much more in the next couple days, but we can always find the change in enthalpy for a reaction by taking the sum of the enthalpies of the products minus the sum of the enthalpies of the reactants. All right, so what we're going to look at here now is called a thermodynamically favored process. Old school, we called that spontaneous. We don't really like to use spontaneous as much anymore because in our world, when we say spontaneous, people think quick, um, unpredictable, fast, explosive, but that's not always the case. We can have reactions in chemistry that are spontaneous that take thousands of years because, as it says there, a thermodynamically favored process is a physical or chemical change that will occur by itself and will continue until equilibrium is reached. Nothing to do with reaction rate or heat. We can have a thermo thermodynamically favored process that is slow. In fact, sometimes they don't even measure any rate. And this is typical when we have a very high activation energy. You might think the reaction is stuck at equilibrium, like at the very beginning, but it's not. If we have a thermodynamically favored process that is not measuring any measurable rate, we say it is under kinetic control. And we'll explore this in more depth later. 
And the other thing to note here that we'll come back to and talk about, but just because a reaction is endothermic does not mean that it is automatically not thermodynamically favored. And we'll see some examples of that. But here's some visual representations without getting too in-depth, but basically a ball or a rock will roll down a hill um, on its own. It cannot roll up a hill. That is not thermodynamically favored. Work would have to be done for that to happen. Iron, when it's exposed to oxygen and water, rusts on its own, thermodynamically favored, spontaneous process. You will never go out to your car and look and say, oh my gosh, the rust is gone. It spontaneously turned into iron. No, that would have to be done using chemical means and reactions and electrolysis or other ways to get it to go that direction. Same thing with heat. Heat flows from higher energy objects to lower. It will never go from lower to higher on its own. It can be forced with refrigerator pumps or whatnot, but not on its own. So will a chemical reaction go as it is written? Is it thermodynamically favored as it's written? And this is where we look at entropy. As you see there, it's a thermodynamic quantity. It's a measure of how dispersed the energy of a system is among all the different possible ways that that system can contain energy. All right, How much does the energy of our atoms or molecules become spread out during a process? Now another evil connection is that people always want to say entropy is a measure of disorder. Fortunately for us in chemistry, we can allow that to be talked about because we should really only refer to entropy as a measure of a disorder for molecular systems. You don't, physicists and other people don't like to use the term as a direct measure of disorder. But here you see a classic example. I've got a flask with a gas in it trapped on one side and there's a valve keeping that gas there. If you remove the valve, the gas will spontaneously on its own begin to fill both sides of the container evenly. The disorder of the molecules is increasing. It's spreading out. It's transferring. Okay, the energy is being dispersed. I think it's kind of easy to think about it through the eyes of water. Okay, water, that is ice, is in a rigid structure, a nice honeycomb-like pattern, and one mole of ice at 273 Kelvin, zero degrees Celsius, has a measured entropy of 41 joules per Kelvin. Liquid water obviously has the ability to flow and move around, although it's still held together very tightly with hydrogen bonds. But there is more motion. The energy is dispersed. More, quote-unquote, molecular disorder. A higher level of entropy. So as it says here, in a thermodynamically favored process, the entropy of the system and the surroundings increases. Energy is being dispersed. Entropy is being created. Again, energy is not created. Energy is conserved. We can't create energy, we can't destroy it. But we can create entropy. All right, and we'll continue to work with this concept of entropy as we continue to move onward into the wonderful world of thermodynamics.